All right. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to tonight's Journal Club, our Med Safety Journal Club. So our original presenter, it was me, Jacqueline Igwe, but she's on maternity leave. So we have her PGY2 ambulatory care resident, Taylor Harris, stepping in. She also helped develop these slide decks, so she's no, no stranger to the contents. So for a brief introduction of Taylor, uh, Dr. Taylor Harris received her doctorate of pharmacy from Larkin University College of Pharmacy in Miami, Florida in 2021. She completed her PGY-1 community-based pharmacy residency at Nova Southeastern University College of Pharmacy and is currently completing her PGY-2 training in ambulatory care at Baptist Health South Florida. Taylor's goal is to operate in a pharmacist-led clinic working under a collaborative practice agreement to care for patients with diabetes, weight loss management, and heart failure. Outside of residency, Taylor likes to discover new restaurants, go to concerts, spend time with her friends and family, especially her baby nephew, <laughs> swim with her dog Moose, and go to the gym. Yeah, with that introduction have... complete, Taylor, the floor is yours, and go ahead and get started. Thank you, Benjamin. So thank you guys for being here. I know it is Thursday evening, and you know we're all wanting to eat, so I will try to make this as brief as possible, but try to get you as much information as possible. So. Today's topic is USP 795 and you, the need to know updates for USP 795. Um, as Benjamin mentioned, Jacqueline, my mentor and preceptor for med safety was supposed to be joining me for her presentation, for this presentation. However, she did deliver a baby last week, so we'll, we'll make it easy on her. <laughs> So just as a disclaimer, um, we have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Please refer to USP 795 standards to address any questions and that this is not an endorsed presentation from USP, but an expert opinion after many hours of analyzing the content and consulting with USP. These are some abbreviations that you'll be seeing throughout my slides. So the objectives of this presentation is to review the history and relevance of the United States Pharmacopeia or USP. Uh, we'll be analyzing the 2022 updates to USP 795 and we'll be applying updates to current practice to identify any gaps in compliance. So what is USP? Um, it's considered an independent scientific nonprofit organization focused on building trust in the supply of safe quality medicines. It's really important to make sure that you guys are aware that this is not a government agency, though, so this is not something like the FDA that is a requirement for many drugs to pass through. However, it is something that is heavily endorsed by, especially with Florida law, to make sure that we are compliant with USP. So the history of USP, um, it was birthed um, by founders Lyman Spaulding and Samuel Mitchell. They're both physicians. One of them was a politician. One of them was a professor. Um, they created standards for the quality of medications to protect the public's health back in January 1820. So it's been quite some time since USP has been around or the idea of making quality safe medications for patients. For um, history of the USP in 1906, there was recognition of USP standards for strength, purity, and quality of medicines. This was due to some contamination of diphtheria antitoxin injections with tetanus, um, which led to the death of 13 children, unfortunately, and also another case of contamination of smallpox, smallpox vaccines. <clears throat> in 1938, it became a requirement to use USP standards because there was the elixir of sulfonam uh, sulfonamide that was tested for appearance and taste, but not for safety, which resulted in over 100 deaths. Um, this eventually led to the creation of the Food Drug Cosmetic Act to enforce this requirement, which was the FDA. So how is it applicable today? Um, the 1984 Drug Pi Price Com Competition and Patient Restoration Act um, required generic medications manufactured to meet the same standards for identity, strength, purity, and quality, and is therapeutically equivalent to the branded product. Um, it establishes specifications, expectations, and testing methods for manufacturers to bring generic products to market. It only, it's not only just for standardizing generic medications, but for any product that's compounded or any hazardous, hazardous drugs that are handled, shipped, delivered to patients. We want to make sure that we can continue you know, keep the quality there of the medications that we're delivering. And it's also required by compliance standards by accrediting bodies such as URAC, ACHC, and beyond. 
So there are still patients that are being affected by compounding errors today. Um, there is a case, a 10-year-old child received the incorrect strength of a compounded clonidine capsule, resulting in an ED visit and PICU observation for 16 hours. Thankfully, the child did not pass away. However, this is something that resulted in an unneeded ED visit and a PICU stay for 16 hours um, just due to a compounding error. And then for case two, we have a 30-year-old um, compounded a 30-year-old uh, person on compounded lyothyronine um, that received a batch of capsules that were a thousand times the prescribed dose, which resulted in thyrotoxicosis. Again, the patient did not pass away. However, this is something that needed emergency attention, uh, resulted in another emergency visit, um, and something that could have been prevented as long as USP standards were being followed. And then case number three, this is just more um, things that I've seen in my own practice of working at different retail companies, working at my current location, but incorrect beyond use dates be, um, being assigned to compounded products. So I previously have seen somebody giving magic mouthwash at a six month BUD when that's totally incorrect, depending on what's included in there. It's typically a 14 day BUD. Um, so just following standards that are established would help identify those errors as well. So these are some important USP chapters, and I'm going to briefly mention the other ones, but our focus of this presentation is USP 795, non-sterile compounding. So for USP 659, packaging and storing, this establishes standards for packaging and storage requirements for medications to ensure quality is preserved. It does define different temperature excursions, such as this package can get to this um, temperature and still be okay if it's been kept at that temperature for a short period of time, which is a defined time. If it goes more than that, then there is an issue with the product and it should not be used. This is applicable for pharmacies that deliver medications to patients. So in our practice setting, we do have delivery options. So this is something that we have to test and we have to do cold chain testing, which means we send kind of like dupe um, packages to different locations with the correct packaging technique. So the ice packs, and whatnot, just to monitor how the temperature varies. And we live in Florida, so we know it's hot all the time, um, but hotter in the summer. So we have to usually do it in the winter and at the summertime just to make sure that these temperature excursions are happening and they're consistent and they're not going over what um, we're expecting. And then for USP 795, non-sterile compounding, this establishes a standard for compounding non-sterile preparations, and I'm going to refer to them as C and SPS for, um, for the rest of the conversation and also for both humans and animals. The purpose is just to minimize harm to patients and to ensure appropriate quality of medications. CNSPs. Um, can be made in outpatient pharmacies to dispense to patients for home use, so different um, suspensions, and if you compound a suspension and then you flavor it, then that's something that may become on a CNSP. Um, and then we also have our different magic mouthwashes and different, you know, um, things that we compound in a pharmacy that don't necessarily need to be in a sterile location that can cause issues like capsules and whatnot. Um, we also have com uh, compounding is defined as combining and mixing, diluting, pooling, or reconstituting other than as provided in manufacturer labeling. So as I mentioned, if you have an amoxicillin prescription for a child and they need just that reconstitution done where you add the water, that's not applicable for USP 795. However, when you decide to alter that by maybe adding flavoring because the child's not going to take the medication if it doesn't taste like bubble gum, that becomes a CNSPS and USP 795 will be applicable to that um, medication. USP 795 was revised on November 1st of 2022 and everything that we'll be talking about is something that's coming towards um, being applicable today soon. Um, it does go in effect November 1st, 2023. Um, harm is defined as microbial growth, variability from intended strength of correct ingredients, physical and chemical incompat incompatibilities, chemical and physical containments, and use of ingredients of an inappropriate quality. So we're doing all of this to minimize that type of harm to patients. For USP 797, it's sterile compounding. And again, it's just to establish standards for compounding sterile preparations or CSPs for both humans and animals. This is to prevent patient harm and to ensure appropriate quality. 
Most pharmacies, retail pharmacies, do not compound sterile uh, products. However, infusion centers and pharmacies compounding for infusion centers or in home infusion need to be compliant with USP 797. And this was also revised on November 1st of last year. And then for USP 800 hazardous drugs, this is just establishes guidelines on how to manage and handle hazardous drugs. What are the different you know, disposal techniques? What should we do? How should we document? You know, it outlines how we perform assessment of risk to determine if there's a need for alternative containment strategies. Do these medications need to be stored somewhere else? Do they have to be contained when they're being expired? What are the certain protocols in place for hazardous drug handling? Um, it does depend on the different hazardous drug, the dosage form of the drug, the risk of exposure, packaging, and manipulation. And manipulation just means are you taking that medication and taking it out of the original container and putting it in a normal amber vial to to dispense to the patient. That's called manipulation because you're taking it out of its natural environment. So USP 795, non-sterile compounding, what's new? Again, as I mentioned previously, November 1st, updates were published by the USP Compounding Expert Committee, and these updates go into effect November 1st of this year, which we have a little bit of time to get compliant, but um, there are some things that did change for the better to make it easier on pharmacies. So overview of updates, these are the biggest changes that happened for these updates. So they developed guidance for conveying BUDs for CNSPs in the absence of stability information. So it's something that you compounded from scratch. You're not sure what the typical, you know, BUD would be for this patient or for this prescription and how safe it is for the patient. And previously, and I'll talk about this more, it was depending on if it's aqueous or non-aqueous. But this gets a little bit more specific now, and that leads into my next point. It expanded on the role of water activity, which is defined as AW in determining BUD limits for preparations. Um, we also have addition of commonly compounded dosage forms and the respective AW values to aid compounders in determining BUD limits for CNSPS. And then we are, um, you know, showing different requirements for identifying the need for a recall and related procedures. So no stability information on the product, that's no problem. USP introduced a new concept to 795 to avoid confusion and misinterpretation of non-aqueous or water containing as in previous versions of 795. And this is where water activity or AW comes in um, for us to be able to determine what that stability would be in the absence of that stability information. So what is it? It better assesses susceptibility of a CNSP to a microbial contamination and potential for degradation due to hydrolysis. It helps determine more accurate BUDs and, you know, specifically a higher AUW um, equals a greater opportunity for microbial growth or hydrolysis. So a higher AUW would mean in layman's turn that there's more water or aqueous activity going on in this compound. Um, so if they have it with a higher AW, that typically means that there's gonna be a shorter BUD just so we prevent that opportunity for micro microbial growth and hydrolysis. Now, if the medication, let's say you have something that has stability information that's present, whether it's published or not, you can still utilize that over USP recommendations but this is just typically for uh, prescriptions that don't have that type of stability information backing your recommendation for a BUD. So different dosage forms and water activity. So we have our non-aqueous dosage forms and that's defined as an AW of less than 0 0.60. These are just very um, common things that we would see in a normal pharmacy when it comes to making suspensions or different, um, you know, oral agents. Um, this is not all inclusive. The, in the USP 795, it does have more, more dosage forms that would be applicable to different pharmacies, but I went ahead and included the more common ones. So oral solution that's glycol based, and this is defined as 20% polyethylene glycol and 80% propylene glycol has an AW of 0 0.009. Anything that's oral solution that has oil-based or fixed oil, um, it is considered non-aqueous. 
For our aqueous dosage forms, that means an AW of more than 0 0.6. And these are all of our water-based oral solutions. So our low sucrose syrup vehicle has an AW of 0 0.906. Um, our oral suspension base has a 0 0.992, so definitely something that's aqueous, something that needs to have a shorter um, BUD associated with it. And a good example of the low so sucrose syrup vehicle is Aura Suite, and we see that a lot when it comes to making suspensions. So previously in 795, if they were water containing oral formulations, they had a BUD assigned to 14 days and it needed to be refrigerated. For other water containing uh, formulations that were more topical or dermal, mucosal liquids and semi-solids, it had a BUD of 30 days at a controlled room temperature. For non-aqueous formulations, so this is with no water, a BUD of six months was applicable as long as they were in controlled room temperature. <clears throat> For the updated 795, we have our non-preserved aqueous dosage forms, and that's a uh, water activity of more than 0 0.6. They have a BUD of 14 days of refrigeration. Um, for our preserved aqueous dosage forms, <coughs> excuse me, um, they have a BUD of 35 days as long as they're controlled room temperature or refrigerator. For our oral liquids, our non-aqueous liquids, and they have a water activity or AW of less than 0 0.6, 90 days is applicable as long as they're kept at room temperature or refrigerated. And then our other non-aqueous dosage forms would have a BUD of 180 days with controlled room temperature or refrigerator. For examples of preparations, just because I know that this is a little bit of hard things to grasp, especially when you're just reading, oh, non-preserved aqueous, oh yeah, that makes so much sense. For our non-preserved aqueous dosage forms, those look more like emulsions, gels, creams, solutions, sprays, suspensions. Same thing with our preserved aqueous dosage forms. It just has preservatives in it. That's what I could say is the difference, but they're still aqueous based. For our non-aqueous oral liquids, um, you know, that was a little bit harder to define because I find that most of our medications that we compound do have a aqueous component to it, whether like a dexamethasone solution that you use inside of a magic mouthwash is going to have water listed in the inactive ingredients. And it's really important that when you're making these medications, these compounds, that you look at the inactive ingredients because that does apply to the overall um, compound. Okay, so saying that, oh, I just put lidocaine, I put the lidocaine, Benadryl, and dexamethasone to make this magic mouthwash, it's non-aqueous, is incorrect. And then for our other non-aqueous dosage forms, we're looking at capsules, tablets, powders, suppositories, trochies, and non-aqueous topicals. So the other thing that they looked at for USP 795, the updates, was recall and traceability. So 7, USP 795 requires the compounding record to be traceable in the case of a recall or quality issue. Now, this means that you would need to implement a type of recall procedure um, and that it has to be documented to appropriate regulatory bodies. So having a DQI um, team or something that reviews things on a constant basis um, is important for these recall and traceability requirements. And then you also have to make sure that this documentation includes the initiation of a recall procedure, notification and disposal and um, of CNSPs and unused stock, making sure that that's all documented and reported to the correct regulatory bodies. This kind of plays in tune with our Drug Supply Chain Security Act that just recently got updated in 2023. Um, it was to impl implement an interoperable electronic tracing of products at the package level. This is to improve efficiency of recalls. So having this recall and traceability included into USP 795 makes this Drug Supply Chain Act requirement a little bit easier because you're already having that documentation available. Um, we're also having tracing requirements for manufacturers, repackagers, wholesale distributors, and dispensers, which are us pharmacies. Um, it has to include transaction information, transaction history, transaction statement, 
Um, tracing documentation has to be stored for six years, paper or electronic, and the process to investigate and handle suspect or legitimate products has to be in place. Um, and again, this all relates to USP 795 requirement for recall and traceability. So they're kind of like meshing in a way to make things a little bit easier and more applicable as to why are we doing these things. So I'm just gonna go through each section of USP 795 and give you some friendly reminders of different requirements because I think it's important. And at our organization, we did do a gap analysis and we found some things that we wanted to make and emphasize with um, our team. So personnel and training and evaluation, they have to have competencies that are demonstrated every 12 months, including the following that are listed, including height, hand hygiene, garbing, cleaning, sanitizing, handling and transporting components of CNSP, CNSPs, uh, measuring and mixing, proper use of equipment, and documentation of compounding process. Um, so these are different things that we have to make sure that our personnel who are maybe doing these compounds are compliant with. For personal hygiene and garbing, uh, proper hand hygiene procedures and uh, garb glove requirements are, are supposed to be followed. Um, at my previous retail experience, you know, I would get a magic mouthwash prescription, I'd put it on the counter and I would mix it, you know, on there because I'm not touching anything. Why would I need to have all this different things here? But actually, as per USP 795, even if you're compounding a CNS piece, uh, CNS piece, you need to have gloves on. Gloves are very important and everything is supposed to be on there. So gloves, gloves, gloves all the time. Another thing is um, washing hands with soap and water is recommended because hand sanitizer and alcohol is not appropriate. I know it kind of gets, you know, busy in the pharmacy or at any place and it's like, oh, let me just put some hand sanitizer on my hands and I'm going to do this real quick. But they actually prefer you to have your hands washed with soap and water. Um, before compounding anything. And it makes sense. We don't want to give patients potentially contaminated things. I mean, hopefully everybody has a certain hand hygiene standard and that they're very clean, um, but we just have to make sure we take that extra step for our patients. The other thing is making sure that we're garbing as per manufacturer or the safety data sheet guidance. So there are different compounding or compounds that we do have to garb up for more than just the gloves. Um, and then for our non-disposable garb, like goggles that can be reused, we should be sanitizing them with 70% isopropyl alcohol. For building and facilities, this is something that hasn't really changed, but it did describe the compounding space, the storage area, and the appropriate water sources that need to be available for use. Um, compounding equipment and utensils should be cleaned with purified or distilled water. So I know it's very easy to put it in the sink and like kind of wash it with there within the, the sink. However, we should be using purified or distilled water. And there is such thing as USP water, which I think is just a fancy term of purified water um, and that we should be cleaning all of our utensils that touch a compound with. For cleaning and sanitizing, um, there is an outline for how many, you know, what's the minimum frequency for various surfaces, including in compounding that need to be cleaned and sanitized. Um, if you're not compounding every day, you need to clean and sanitize the area before compounding and then again afterwards because you're not doing it every day so that area is not being clean or sanitized very often. Um, you do have to document for each of the cleanings and then you have to you know do this on a regular basis again as I said or before and after each compounding is done. For equipment and components, this outlines specific, specific, specifics for compounding equipment and components to reduce risk of cross-contamination or bio-burden. So if you're using, um, I forget the name of them, but I did have a rotation in the compounding pharmacy where you're using one of those machines that mix everything. You have to make sure that every part of that machine is cleaned before compounding something else just to avoid that cross-contamination. <clears throat> And then um, they do have recommendations for cleaning frequencies dependent on the materials that the equipment is consisted of. And usually the equipment have certain cleaning um, and regulatory updates that need to be done within the, the manuals that come with them. Now for master formulation and compounding records, it does require that there is an MFR or master formulation record and a compounding record. 
Um, they do favor this, and I actually had to reach out to the USP 795 to get clarification. And they say, you know, it really is dependent on your state and the statutes, and there is no guidance in Florida Board of Pharmacy rules or statutes that I could find that require an M uh, master formulation record for non-sterile uh, medications. However, compounding records must be there. <clears throat> So um, reconstituted medications, so medications that you do, you know, that amoxicillin uh, quick reconstitution that you give to the patient and they don't want any flavoring, that doesn't need to be stored in the compounding record. But if they alter or flavor it, this now becomes a compound and you have to add it into that compounding record. And then same thing uh, with compounded preparations, they should be stored in a, a master formulation record when it's compounded for the first time. Um, but again, this is dependent on the local regulator if it is actually required. At our institution, we would really just have a compounding record um, because all the formulations we get are different or slightly altered depending on the prescriber preference. And then they have a section on release inspections. So just making sure that the CNSPs are visually inspected before they're released to the patient to ensure that the physical appear appearance is as expected, um, making sure that all the labeling matches the compounding record and prescription order, that the integrity of the container closure is there and that all inspections and checks should be documented in the facility um, MFR. For labeling, um, it outlines what should be included on the labels for CNSPs. And these are all required. However, I found that these are often missed on prescription labels. So an accurate BUD, most pharmacy software systems do generate a one year beyond use date or expiration date that's inappropriate for compounds. So we have to make sure that we put in the accurate expiration date for these medications and that they're printed on the label. Um, for CNSPs, USP actually does recommend that there's an indication for use on the prescription label so that having that somewhere in the SIG or having that somewhere if the doctor documents that this magic mouthwash is used for chemotherapy or uh, mouth sores or whatever, that that's on the label as well so the patient is aware. And then they also want the active ingredients plus their amounts or concentrations or activities. So with this being said, the label only has so much space. So this is a little bit hard to jam pack onto that label, but if they have, they want a dexamethasone, you know, whatever the, the milligram per ml on there, they also want the nystatin a thousand units per ml on there. And then they want uh, diphenhydramine with the milligram per ml on there. That all has to be included on the prescription label. So finding the space for it may be a challenge, However, that is up to the discretion of the compounding facility of how they include that on the, the label. Um, of course, standard, standard operating procedures should be uh, created for all aspects relating to compounding operations. Just because this is a reference of duties to different personnel, um, just to make sure that SOPs are being followed. Let's say you have a call out on somebody that usually will do compounding and you need somebody to step in, this should be able to direct them to do it safely and as compliant with USP 795. And then we also have the quality assurance and control um, section, which outlines requirements for quality assurance programs to ensure high quality CNSPs are prepared. Um, it formally established in this SOPs to ensure compliance and the program must be reviewed and documented on every 12 months. So at our institution, we have quarterly meetings, we have things that if they need to be addressed as soon as possible, that they are done so appropriately and through the correct channels. We have an SOP to direct people and a policy and procedure to direct people on how to report to different things and how to access the quality assurance committee. It really is to have an evaluation of also complaints, adverse drug events, adherence to procedures and prevention or detection of errors. And then CNSPs packaging and transporting. So as 
I mentioned with USP 659, it's to comply with that and USP 800 if the medication is hazardous. It's just requirements for SOPs for the packaging and transporting of these medications. Um, they must protect the CNSPs from damage, leakage, contamination, and degradation, as well as protecting our personnel from exposure. We wouldn't want the patient or the person who is handling the medication to get exposed to whatever is inside that vial. We also have um, audits of transportation to ensure that there's compliance with temperature requirements and excursions, aka USP 659, um, and we also have that traceability component to this as well. And then compliant um, complaint handling and ADE reporting. So just an SOP for um, reporting and acknowledgement of any uh, issues that may arise relating to a compounded product, including with labeling, quality, and possible adverse drug event. For documentation, these are the minimal uh, documentation or requirements that are outlined, and that would be for personnel training, equipment records, receipt of components, which is like recall and traceability of the different uh, you know, raw products that are being used, SOPs, the um, master formulation record, the compounding record, the release inspection, so the visual inspections before the medication is released to the patient, different temperature logs, accommodations to personnel, uh, compounding CNSPs, and cleaning and sanitizing records. So I know we went through a lot in a pretty short period of time, but I have a few assessment questions just to see what's going on and how, if you understand um, what was presented. So question one, you're making a compounding utilizing an ingredient with a an water activity of 0 0.9. What is the compound considered? A, non-aqueous, B, aquatic, C, aqueous, or D, non-aquatic. Anybody can jump in. C, aqueous. C, aqueous, correct. Does anybody have any questions regarding this? So remember, in a water activity of more than 0 0.6 would be considered aqueous. A, a W of less than 0 0.6 would be considered non-aqueous. Any questions? Okay. Question number two, true or false? An, an aqueous CNSP has an increased risk for microbial growth, physical degradation, and hydrolysis. <clears throat> True or false? Kendrick in the chat says true. Correct. True. There is an increased risk of microbial growth, physical degradation, and hydrolysis with an aqueous CNSP. So that's usually directly with, uh, you know, assigned a shorter BUD than um, than something that's considered non-aqueous. So thank you for, for that, Kendrick. And then question three is a little bit of a patient case. <clears throat> so a prescription of magic mouthwash wants to include the following ingredients at equal parts to make a solution of 360 ml. That includes nystatin 100,000 units ml uh, per ml suspension, lidocaine 2% viscous solution, and Maalox. What would be an accurate BUD and storage requirement for this CNSP? A, 14 days with refrigeration, B, 35 days at room temperature, C, six months with refrigeration, and D, 90 days at room temperature. This may be a trick question. Kendrick says A question mark and Sonia says A. M. Yes, yes, A is correct. It is 14 days um, and I'll explain to this to, to you why. So you can see here in the recipe that we're not actually adding any purified or distilled water that would make us think, oh, this is going to be something that is definitely an aqueous solution. However, nystatin suspension and lidocaine solution and Maalox, they all have inactive ingredients of water. So it may not be something that is physically active in the prescription or going to be active in the compound. However, it is something that is within the already made preparations. Therefore, the 
the recommendation for a BUD would be 14 days for this product. So it's really important to educate patients to say, hey, you know, this is a lot of volume. However, this is only good for 14 days. Make sure that you dispose of it if you don't use it past a 14 day mark. And that's all I have. What questions do you have for me? Hey, Taylor, this is Ben. Um, first of all, I want to say great presentation. Thank you. Uh, I really enjoy the topic. Um, I'm primarily an inpatient guy, so we don't use a lot of 795. Mm -hmm. you know, we, all the focus is on 797. So it was nice to get a refresher on a lot of things, especially AW. I feel like I haven't used that since <laughs> pharmacy school. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so just a quick question. Uh, in the outpatient world, how often are you seeing compounded preparations come? That's a great question, and I really think it depends on the pharmacy. So I've worked at technically four different retail pharmacies. I worked at CVS. I worked at Publix. I worked at an independent community pharmacy. I worked at um, a community pharmacy owned by university. Uh, I guess it's five. And then I've also done a rotation at our specialty pharmacy at Baptist Health, which is located in the Miami Cancer Institute which we have a lot of patients that are on magic mouthwash prescriptions. So it really just depends on the location and the prescribing habits of, of providers. But I could tell you I've dealt with my fair share of magic mouthwashes. And, you know, it is a little bit, I don't want to say tedious, but it is a little difficult to, to enter it into the system because every formulation is different. So making that master formulation record is a little bit difficult because it's supposed to outline what you're supposed to have in the medication. But sometimes people want, you know, a one to one ratio or they want two to one ratios of different things. So it makes it a little bit harder. And that's why the prescriptions need to be super clear for dispensing. Um, so it just really depends on the location that you're at. Um, I would assume the MCI location for the specialty pharmacy is going to have more compounding than maybe my old Publix where I had patients that were relatively healthy and not needing all these different medications. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question, but it just really depends. I think you did. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for asking. Any other questions? I know we kind of went fast. So if not. <laughs> well, I'm not seeing anything in the chat, Taylor. So I think we're good on questions. All so right. any uh, final words of wisdom before we sign off? Not for me. <laughs> All right. But just well, make sure you're, if you're working in a outpatient setting that's using US or you know, compounding medications that we comply with USP 795. All right. Thank you. Great job, Taylor. Um, awesome. So thank you everyone for joining. Our next presentation is going to be in April, on April 20th, uh, same time, same place. So look out for that. It's going to be on infusion pump best practices and it'll be presented by yours truly. So <laughs> I will see you guys in about a month. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you guys. Have a good night. Thank you.